Hey, CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here. This is your lecture series on probably one of the hardest and deepest topics that we have to go through over the course of the year, rocks. Okay, dad joke. At any rate, uh, let's get started. So just to kind of begin things, I uh, want to touch on the basic outline of what I'm going to cover with you today. Earth processes, minerals, the rock cycle, um, what are like mineral resources are here on this planet and uh, some things about mining and geologic hazards that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so um, some of this stuff might sound familiar to you if you've had an earth science class in the past, but if not, now's your chance to get it. Remember, these videos are always going to be on Mr. Kennedy's um, YouTube channel and uh, outlines of the lecture PowerPoint are available from our class webpage. Here we go. So let's talk about the earth. The earth Ultimately, um, you know, this third rock from the sun, we kind of take it for granted. We think about it as this little blue marble orbiting in space and uh, really pay it no never mind. But it's really a special place. Um, the earth is kind of like an onion. It has layers. Uh, there are layers of the earth include the core, the mantle and the crust. The core is the interior composed mostly of dense, intensely hot metal, mostly iron, um, generates our magnetic field that envelops the earth followed by the mantle. Mantle itself has layers, but we're just going to call it mantle, okay? It's hot, it's a pliable, like semi-solid outer layer surrounding the core, less dense than the core. And then you have the crust. That's where we are, crusty old guys like Mr. Kennedy. The crust is cool, it's lightweight, it's brittle, um, and basically just floats on the mantle. So this is just a little picture to kind of give you the cross section of the earth. Uh, you got to remember those parts and their relative depth. So make sure you take note of that. Tectonic processes. So, hey, since, um, you know, we're getting into this idea of crust and mantle and all of that, we got to talk about the tectonic plates. Uh, the earth's crust is broken up into pieces that we call tectonic plates. So the upper layer of the mantle creates these things called convection currents. A convection current basically occurs anytime we have hot air or hot liquid for that matter rising due to its decreased density. And then as it cools, it starts to fall back to wherever it started. So if we're talking about like, you know, air, um, as it gets hot down here at the ground level in Fresno, that's gonna create warm air that rises up into the atmosphere as it goes higher in the atmosphere, it cools down and then comes full circle and falls back towards the surface of the earth where it can be reheated. That's a convection current. I'll show you some examples of those in demos another time. Right now, we just need to apply that to what's going on in the mantle. The mantle does the same thing. So at the core of the earth, it's intensely hot. So this molten rock, if you will, that makes up the mantle is heated at the core and then starts to rise towards the surface where the crust is and cool as it does so, okay? As it cools, its density increases and it makes a right or a left or a forward or a backward, whatever you want to call it, and starts to fall back towards the core of the planet. As a result of these convection currents spinning as they do in the mantle, uh, the crust breaks up into plates and literally floats along its surface, right? So these tectonic plates will actually slide slowly across the Earth's surface uh, under the push or maybe pull of the magma from the mantle underneath, okay? Molten rock underneath. Um, ocean basins form where continents or tectonic plates are actually pulled apart. And uh, mountain or mid-ocean ridge um, structures form where that molten rock is pushed up through the cracks. This is a map just kind of show you some of the different tectonic plates uh, across the surface of the globe. You'll probably have to zoom in to see them all, but we're going to do an activity uh, called the Epicenter Lab later on in the week, and uh, you're going to use maps just like this to locate earthquakes, locate volcanoes, and stuff like that, and I'll bet that you find uh, a whole bunch of activity along these borders, okay? Where tectonic plates are pushing against each other, maybe one's diving under the other, one's grinding against the other, 
um, you get all kinds of interesting geologic processes occurring. Okay, so uh, one of those geologic processes, and we'll talk more about this in a later slide, is an earthquake. Earthquakes are caused by two tectonic plates literally colliding with one another and slipping past one another, creating a jerking motion. Um, mountain ranges push up at the margins of these colliding plates. And when oceanic plates collide with continental land masses, the continental plate what, could actually ride up over the seafloor, creating a subduction zone. And as that subduction zone evolves, uh, creating a deep ocean trench, we can even get volcanoes several miles inland. So there's all kinds of really cool tectonic processes that occur from the convection currents that are pushing these tectonic plates around on the surface. This is a little um, diagram just to kind of show you all those things in one fail swoop. So um, basically what you're looking at is a continental crust or continental plate riding up over the top of an oceanic plate. That oceanic plate ultimately was made here at this mid-oceanic ridge where two plates started moving away from each other. And as they move away from each other, that creates a trench between those two plates that's slowly filled by magma moving up from the mantle, creating or generating more oceanic plate. Um, that pushes that oceanic plate uh, this way towards the continental plate. Oceanic crust is made mostly of basaltic rock, which is more dense than the continental plate's um, rock composition. So the heavier basaltic rock tends to dive under the continental plate. Uh, continental plate rides up on the surface, and as it does so, okay, it will eventually melt down here into the mantle. All that magma makes its way back up to the surface through cracks, in the continental crust, and that's where we get volcanoes. If any of you guys have ever been to Morro Bay, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Morro Rock, that famous structure, that landmark along our coastline, is actually a remnant of an ancient volcano. And if you follow it in the air um, towards San Luis Obispo, you're going to see seven big um, peaks that travel all the way towards San Luis Obispo. They're actually called the Seven Sisters. And each one of those is a volcano that was formed exactly like this. Okay, that's kind of cool. Um, anyways, some other plate boundaries. Um, if the plates are moving away from each other, we call that a divergent boundary. So, you know, in that mid-ocean ridge where the plates are moving away from each other, um, that is a divergent plate boundary uh, where the oceanic plate was colliding with the continental plate and you got one diving under the other, we call that a convergent plate, okay? Um, if you move inland, places like California, we have a situation where we have tectonic plates not diving um, or moving apart, but instead sliding back and forth past each other. That's what the San Andreas Fault is. That's what's called a transform fault, okay? If you're not familiar with the San Andreas Fault, you're not from California. Okay, so moving on from here, rocks and minerals. All right, so geologic processes and the value of our Earth's crust really comes from this stuff, rocks and minerals. Minerals, a naturally occurring inorganic solid element or compound has a definite chemical composition. That picture that I'm showing you down there, that's not just a cool quilt or mural. That is an electron micrograph basically of a cross section of a rock. And each of those different colors represents a different mineral in that rock. Kind of cool. All right. Um, rock types. So um, as we talk about rock types, we're not talking about Dwayne Johnson or Chris. Uh, we're talking about, you know, that stuff in the Earth's crust. Okay. So a rock is a solid cohesive aggregate of one or more minerals. Um, it does have to be solid to be considered a rock. Each rock has its own characteristic mixture of minerals, grain sizes, and all of that that holds it together. And we can kind of use that like a fingerprint, not only to name the rock, but to know where it came from. Okay, so that's kind of neat. Um, the rock cycle is what actually makes, destroys those rocks, and then makes those rocks again. It's the cycle of creation, destruction, and or metamorphosis for those rocks. And there's three basic categories 
of rock classification that you need to know for this class. Igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock, okay? Um, the one that you're probably most familiar with because you live in someplace like California is sedimentary rock, right? Sedimentary rock is rock that is put down in layers in places like the seafloor um, or places where there have been maybe volcanic eruptions um, or rivers or streams that have deposited a lot of sediment over time. And you get layer after layer after layer after layer that is pressed down and compacted to the point where it becomes a solid and you know, that's where we get sedimentary rock from, okay? Um, igneous and metamorphic rock are uh, produced in a little bit different fashion under heat and pressure, okay? So this gives you an idea of the different types of rock and uh, where they might form with regards to heat and pressure. Um, the rock that is formed with probably the highest heat and highest pressure uh, down there is that uh, igneous rock. We could take sedimentary rock and we can convert it to metamorphic rock by putting it under heat and pressure. We can take igneous rock and if we break it up, igneous rock can actually form layers to become sedimentary rock, right? So this is just kind of an illustration of how all the different rock types are created with different variables in terms of heat and pressure and how one can become another, okay? Um, so a little bit of background uh, to fill out your notes and the last little bit of information on the rock types for you here. Igneous rock is the most common type of rock in Earth's crust. It's solidified from magma extruded onto the surface from volcanic vents. Uh, quick cooling of the magma produces like the fine grained rock of basalt. Basalt is usually very dark. And if you look at it in cross section, um, it's really hard to see like the individual grains. You'd have to have a magnifying glass. Compare that to slow cooling magma, which produces granite. I'm sure a lot of you have granite in your home, on your kitchen counter, your bathroom counter, whatever. Um, but granite's super easy to see like the big chunks in it because it cooled a lot more slowly. Um, metamorphic rock. Uh, metamorphic rock is where we take a pre-existing rock, we heat it and we put it under pressure and um, that causes the minerals in the rock to interact with each other and change state, so to speak, or change form. So the chemical reactions alter both the composition and the structure of the rock as they are metamorphosed, right? So you can get stuff like marble, quartzite, and slate by metamorphosizing, that's a word, um, stuff like granite, okay? So marble comes from lamps, limestone, Quartzite is from sandstone and uh, slate is a combination of either mud uh, stone and shale. All right. Now, how do we get these rock forms to change? And like, how do we go from, say, like, I don't know, igneous rock to sedimentary rock? Well, that's where you got to understand weathering and sedimentation. OK, so in terms of weathering, there's mechanical weathering, which is the physical breakup of rocks into smaller parts. Um, without actually changing their chemical composition. So I don't know if I drive my four wheel drive up into the mountains and like, you know, go bouncing over rocks and I take a big rock and I break it into little pieces of rock or something. Or if I just, you know, decide to pick up a rock and crush it in my hands, right? Um, that's mechanical weathering, right? I'm breaking the rock up into smaller pieces without changing its chemical composition. Chemical weathering is a little different. Um, this, you know, often involves, you know, water or some other type of chemistry where we will selectively remove or alter specific components of the rock to weaken it and disintegrate it. Places we see this a lot, like, you know, if you live someplace where there's acid rain coming down from the sky, like in the um, Midwest of the United States, like the, the, the rain hits the rocks and the acids in the rain, like literally eat certain particles out of the rock, leaving others behind. That's chemical weathering. OK, can cause oxidation and or hydrolysis in the rock. Um, now, when all these things come together, the mechanical weathering, the chemical weathering, whatever is left behind goes through the sedimentation process. So deposits of particles or rock are transported by wind, water and ice into a new location. They get squished together and we get a new rock type. OK, um, and that's sedimentary rock. Right. We kind of already talked about sedimentary rock. It's laid down in layers, but here's all the nuts and bolts about it. It's the positive materials that remain in place long enough or are covered with enough material for compaction so that they stick together and stay together. Um, they can also be formed from crystals that precipitate um, out of or grow from a solution. 
Sedimentary rock is very often shaped by erosion. It's not a really hard um, or dense rock. So if the wind is blowing, um, you know, just the little other particles of rock and sand in the wind can like literally carve into the sedimentary rock. Or if it's near water, the water can carve through the sedimentary rock pretty easily. Um, so that's kind of fun stuff. Geomorphology, if you're interested in that, um, is actually the study of the processes that shaped the Earth's surface and uh, and the structures that we see. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Maybe that's the area you're interested. Just to kind of show you a picture of sedimentary rock, like here's a great one. This is Bryce Canyon National Park. Um, I've never been there. I stole this from your book because it's like cool. All right. Um, economic geology is coming up next. So um, what do we get? out of these rocks? Like, is it just neat to look at or is there is there some value? I can honestly tell you um, it, it's both, right? Yeah, it's neat to look at. I mean, you know, Bryce Canyon's beautiful, but yeah, there's also money to be made in the minerals that come from our Earth's crust. Here's a short list of some things that we really like in the crust of the Earth and we mine readily uh, in order to make money, okay? So uh, don't be fooled. Like, yeah, there's wealth to be had from mining. So in terms of economics and, um, you know, how much do we extract and how much do we get? Uh, here's just another little short list. Metals consumed in the greatest quantity by the world industry in metric tons. Should not surprise you that iron is number one. 740 million metric tons of iron are used annually. Because, dude, you need it for building all kinds of stuff, like the cars that you drive. Well, they they used to all be made out of iron. Now you got about a 50-50 split between iron and plastic. But there's still a lot of iron in there, and you need it for cars and buildings and all that kind of stuff. Um, your cell phones and everything else have all kinds of precious metals in them, copper, chromium, uh, all the way to gold, right? Nickel, it's all um, being used at, uh, at at huge rates on a global scale. Um, that's not to mention the other things that we find in the in the Earth's crust that are also useful to us, like gemstones. Okay, so as we go digging around for something like iron, we might come across things like diamonds. Okay, their monetary value realistically is all centered around the value that we place on them. Since diamonds are hard to find, we you know will pay a a, a hefty price to get one. Okay, so as long as there's people out there that are willing to pay that price, there's going to be people out there willing to dig them up. Okay, um, one thing that's kind of unusual is sand and gravel. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't really like look at sand in the river bottom and go, wow, I better like pick some of that up because I could sell that and make lots of money. Um, but hey, there's a lot of money to be had in the sand and gravel industry when you think about what's underneath there. Glass production, brick, concrete construction, paving, sandblasting, road construction, all that kind of stuff like that. If you don't have sand and gravel, like you probably wouldn't have the house that you're in or the roof that's on your house, right? Or the road um, to your house or anything like that. Like So sand and gravel is huge. There's actually a sand and gravel uh, well, pit or mining uh, operation that's going on just very close to this school that most people probably don't even realize is there. If you go over to Woodward Park and maybe just drive a little bit up Friant, um, you're going to see uh, concrete trucks, um, you know, cement trucks all, all over the place off to the side of the road. They have been using the, um, the, the river bottom there for literally decades, pulling sand and gravel out of the San Joaquin River as it passes there and making concrete and other things from that and uh, just like tried to renew their lease for the next 100 years. So we could have that place uh, for a very long time for the years to come. Now, as we pull things out of the ground, obviously that's going to disturb some of the surrounding area. Um, if you've been over or have seen those areas that I'm talking about by Woodward Park, it might look like there are small, um, I don't know, lakes off to the side of the river. Um, those are not lakes. Those are, um, well, gravel pits that they've decided to stop using and they've subsequently filled up with water. It changes the landscape forever. And uh, at the end of the day, some people look at it as, um, you know, kind of like a horrible ice ore. Um, so, 
anytime you remove material from the ground, you will, there will be a disturbance that follows. Uh, could be dust, could be toxic pollutants, could be chemical sediment or runoff. It really just depends on what you're digging for, okay? Now, uh, there are different kinds of mines and different ways to get things out of the ground. So I'm gonna share that with you next. Um, there's a thing called a placer mine. Placer mines hydraulically wash out metals deposited in stream beds, uh, gravel, by using water cannons. So they're literally just like dudes like sitting there with like giant water cannons, like firing them at the stream bed, um, like blasting it apart. It totally destroys the stream bed and fills the surrounding water with all kinds of suspended solids. So from an environmental science standpoint, um, this is not good. Um, underground mining is a little bit better because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. But as we tunnel through the ground, making kind of like our little underground anthills, um, we create another problem in that tunnels can collapse and um, gases from underground can seep out and water can seep into the mine shafts and dissolve toxic chemicals that might be uh, intermixed with the minerals that we're trying to dig out. Um, there can even be fires in the mines. There have been coal mines here, even in the United States, that have caught fire and um, are still burning right? Because they can't put them out. It's just the fire is burning the coal underground and it just keeps going and going and going for decades, okay? Um, this is another example of mining. It's called an open pit or strip mine. 50% um, of U.S. coal is actually strip mine. So I don't know if you can see or tell what's going on here, but this is just a big old like tractor with a big old scoop on the front digging a big old hole, okay? And it just scoops out uh, everything from the top down to the coal vein that they're after and uh, throws it in a dump truck and off it goes. Anything that they can't use, the tailings as they're called, are just pushed off to the side and they just keep chugging along on that coal seam. Um, the surrounding landscape is forever changed. Okay, It will never, ever look the same. Um, no matter what they tell you, because as you dig out that vein of coal, sometimes they say, well, we'll put the tailings back. We're going to put that top soil or whatever back on top. But that's not natural. Like they're just going to throw it back on top. And, um, you know, if there was a mountain there at one point, maybe it's all flat. I don't know. But it's definitely not what it used to be. OK, um, so at the end of the day, um, we've tried to do some things to kind of, you know, help regulate mining. There was the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act that was passed in 1977, which requires better restoration of strip mine lands, especially if the land is classified as prime farmland. So, you know, people will come in and mining trumps farming. So, you know, they're going to come in and they're going to mine the land. Um, and in the prior to this act, they could just, you know, walk away from it when they were done. Well, after 1977, it basically says, hey, no, you got to fix what you broke, pal. Um, so, uh, you know, they got to once they're done mining, they got to take it back to a state where maybe it could be used for agriculture. It's very hard to do this and it's expensive. Um, reclamation costs are often more than ten thousand dollars per hectare. Um, another little thing uh, in terms of mining that I'm just going to throw your way that's kind of crazy to, to think about or, you know, imagine is mountaintop removal mining. Um, it is what its name implies, like mining companies will just go in um, and this is something that's pretty common in the Appalachian Mountains. If you don't know where that is, um, that's in the United States. OK, um, so like East Coast. Anyways, um, they will go in and they will literally just take off the entire um, like top of the mountain to get down to like the coal or whatever else it is that they want. Okay. Um, many of the mining companies that do this have been sued um, and they've been sued for things like, you know, by, um, you know, the environmental lawyers over clean water, because as you move all this stuff out, all those things I said a while ago about, you know, rainwater coming in and getting contaminated and all that, that's like, that's the real deal. Like it happens. This is what it looks like. Crazy, right? Um, there used to be a mountain there and they just came in and went and cut the whole top off. Right. Um, and when they were done getting the coal they wanted, uh, they left. OK. Um, eventually, all the ore has to be processed. So the next step in all this to kind of make um, what you're digging out worthwhile is to process the ore. Metals are extracted by ores um, by heating or treating with chemical solvents, which in and of itself can create other environmental hazards. Smelting is the roasting of ore to release the metals, uh, puts out huge amounts of air pollution, or you could get things like heap 
leach extraction, which is where the crushed ore is piled up into a big old heap. And then they spray it with like chemicals like alkaline cyanide solution, which will percolate through the pile and dissolve things out like gold. It's cool that you get gold that way, but dude, where's the cyanide and stuff go? Okay. The effluent gets left behind in ponds. It can leak into the surface water or the groundwater and become a major, major issue in terms of water pollution. All right, so that's um, your introduction to minerals and rocks and all of that. We're going to stop here, and um, I'm going to pick up this whole story of the earth systems and resources with this next installment on geologic hazards. See you next time.